my name is Dr. Dennis Business. And tonight, tonight we're going to continue our descent into hell. The best way to explain it, Canto 1 and 2, we were at the hotel waiting on the shuttle to go to Disneyland. Now we're off the shuttle, and it's time to stand in line. And that's where we begin today. The poets pass the gate of hell and are immediately assailed by cries of anguish. Dante sees the first of the souls in torment. They are the opportunists, those souls who in life were neither for good nor evil, but only for themselves. Mixed with them are those outcasts who took no sides in the rebellion of the angels. They are neither in hell nor out of it. Eventually unclassified, they race around pursuing a wavering banner that runs forever before them through the dirty air. And as they run, they are pursued by swarms of wasps and hornets who sting them and produce a constant flow of blood and putrid matter which trickles down the bodies of the sinners and is feasted upon by loathsome worms and maggots who coat the ground. The law of Dante's hell is the law of symbolic retribution. As they are sinned, so they are punished. They took no sides, therefore they are given no place. As they pursued the ever-shifting illusion of their own advantage, changing their courses with every changing wind, so they eternally pursue an elusive, ever-shifting banner. As their sin was a darkness, so they move in darkness. As their own guilty conscience pursued them, so they are pursued by swarms of wasps and hornets. And as their actions were a moral filth, so they run themselves eternally through the filth of worms and maggots, which they themselves feed. Dante recognizes several, among them Pope Celestine V. But without delaying to speak to any of the souls, the poets move on to Acheron, the first of the rivers of hell. Here, the newly arrived souls of the damned gather and wait for monstrous Charon to ferry them over to punishment. Charon recognizes Dante as a living man and angrily refuses him passage. Virgil forces Charon to serve them, but Dante swoons with terror and does not reawaken until he is on the other side. I am the way into the city of woe. I am the way to a forsaken people. I am the way into eternal sorrow. Sacred justice moved my architect. I was raised here by divine omnipotence, primordial love, and ultimate intellect. Only those elements time cannot wear were made before me, and beyond time I stand. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. These mysteries I read cut into stone above a gate, and turning I said, Master! What is the meaning of this harsh inscription? And he then, as initiate to novice, Here you must put by all division of spirit and gather your soul against all cowardice. This is the place I told you to expect. Here you shall pass among the fallen people, souls who have lost the good of intellect. So saying, he put forth his hand to me, and with a gentle and encouraging smile, he led me through the gate of mystery. Here, sighs and cries and wails coiled and recoiled on the starless air, spilling my soul to tears. A confusion of tongues and monstrous accents toiled in pain and anger. Voices hoarse and shrill and sounds of blows, all intermingled 
raised tumultuous and pandemonium that still whirls on the air, forever dirty with it, as if a whirlwind sucked at sand. And I, holding my head in horror, cried, Sweet spirit, what souls are these who run through this black haze? And he to me, These are the nearly soulless, whose lives have concluded neither blame nor praise. They are mixed here with that despicable core of angels, who were neither for God nor Satan, but only for themselves. The high creator scourged them here from heaven for its perfect beauty, and hell will not receive them, since the wicked might feel some glory over them. And I said, Master, what gnaws at them so hideously? Their lamentation stuns the very air. They have no hope of death, he answered me. And in their blind and unattaining state, their miserable lives have sunk so low that they must envy every other fate. No word of them survives their living season. Mercy and justice deny them even a name. Let us not speak of them. Look and pass on. I saw a banner there upon the mist. Circling and circling, it seemed to scorn all pause. So it ran on, and still behind it pressed a never-ending rout of souls in pain. I had not thought death had undone so many as passed before me in that mournful train. And some I knew among them. Last of all, I recognized the shadow of that soul who, in his cowardice, made the great denial. At once I understood for certain. These were of that retrograde and faithless crew, hateful to God and his enemies. These wretches, never born and never dead, ran naked in a swarm of wasps and hornets that goaded them the more they fled and made their faces stream with bloody gouts of pus and tears that dribbled to their feet to be swallowed there by loathsome worms and maggots. Then, looking onward, I made out a throng assembled on the beach of a wide river, whereupon I turned to him. Master, I long to know what souls these are, and what strange usage makes them eager to cross as they seem to be in this infected light. At which the sage, All this shall be made known to you, when we stand on the joyless beach of Acheron. And I cast my eyes down, sensing a reprimand in what he said, and so walked at his side in silence and ashamed, until we came through the dead cavern to that sunless tide. There, steering towards us in an ancient ferry, came an old man with a white bush of hair bellowing, Woe to you depraved souls! Bury here and forever all hopes of paradise. I come to lead you to the other shore, into dark, into fire and ice. And you, who are living yet, I say, be gone from those who are dead. But when he saw me stand against his violence, he began again. By other windings and by other steerage shall you cross to that other shore. Not here, not here. A lighter craft than mine must give you passage. And my guide to him. Karen, bite back your spleen. This has been willed where what is willed must be, and it is not yours to ask what it may mean. The steersman of that marsh of ruined souls who wore a wheel of flame around each eye stifled the rage that shook his woolly jowls. But those unmanned and naked spirits there turned pale with fear, and their teeth began to chatter at sound of his crude bellow. In despair they blasphemed God, their parents, their time on earth, the race of Adam, and the day and the hour and the place and the seed and the womb that gave them birth. But altogether they drew to that grim shore where all must come who lose the fear of God. Weeping and cursing, They come for evermore, and demon Karen with eyes like burning coals herds them in, and with a whistling oar flails on the stragglers to his wake of souls. As leaves in autumn loosen and stream down, 
until the branch stands bare above its tatters spread on the rustling ground. So one by one the evil seed of Adam in its fall cast themselves at his signal from the shore and streamed away like birds who hear their call. So they are gone over that shadowy water, and always before they reach the other shore, a new noise stirs on this, and new throngs gather. My son, the courteous master said to me, all who die in the shadow of God's wrath converge to this from every clime and country, and all pass over eagerly, for here divine justice transforms and spurs them, so their dread turns wish. They yearn for what they fear. No soul in grace comes ever to this crossing. Therefore, if care enrages at your presence, you will understand the reason for his cursing. When he had spoken, all the twilight country shook so violently. The terror of it bathes me with sweat even in memory. The tear-soaked ground gave out a sigh of wind that spewed itself in flame on a red sky, and all my shattered senses left me. Blind, like one whom sleep comes over in a swoon, I stumbled into darkness and went down. Dante wakes to find himself across Acheron. The poets are now on the brink of hell itself, which Dante conceives as a great funnel-shaped cave lying below the northern hemisphere, with its bottom point at the Earth's center. Around this great circular depression runs a series of ledges, each of which Dante calls a circle. Each circle is assigned to the punishment of one category of sin. As soon as Dante's strength returns, the poets begin to cross the first circle. Here they find the virtuous pagans. They were born without the light of Christ's revelation, and therefore they cannot come into the light of God. But they are not tormented. Their only pain is that they have no hope. Ahead of them, Dante sights a great dome of light, and a voice trumpets through the darkness welcoming Virgil back for this is his eternal place in hell. Immediately the great poets of all time appear, Homer, Horace, Ovid, and Lucian. They greet Virgil, and they make Dante a sixth in their company. With them, Dante enters the citadel of human reason and sees before his eyes the master of souls of pagan antiquity gathered on a green, and illuminated by the radiance of human reason. This is the highest state man can achieve without God, and the glory of it dazzles Dante, but he knows also that it is nothing compared to the glory of God. A monstrous clap of thunder broke apart the swoon that stuffed my head. Like one awakened by violent hands, I leaped up with a start. And having risen, rested and renewed, I studied out the landmarks of the gloom to find my bearings there as best I could. And I found I stood on the brink of the valley called the Dolores Abyss, the desolate chasm where rolls the thunder of hell's eternal cry, so depthless deep and nebulous and dim that stare as I might into its frightful pit it gave me back no feature and no bottom. Death pale, the poet spoke. Now let us go into this blind world waiting here below us. I will lead and you shall follow. And I, sick with alarm at his new pallor, cried out, How can I go this way when you, who are my strength and doubt, turn pale with terror? And he, The pain of these below us here drains the color from my face for pity, and leaves this pallor you mistake for fear. Now let us go, for a long road awaits us. So he entered, and so he led me in to the first circle and ledge of the abyss. No tortured wailing rose to greet us here, 
but sounds of sighing rose from every side, sending a tremor through the timeless air. A grief breathed out of untormented sadness, the passive state of those who dwelled apart, men, women, children, a dim and endless congress. And the master said to me, in three, and the master said to me, You do not question what souls these are that suffer here before you? I wish you to know before you travel on that these were sinless, and still their merits fail, for they lacked baptism's grace, which is the door of the true faith you were born to. Their birth fell before the age of the Christian mysteries, and so did not worship God's holy trinity in fullest duty. I am one of these. For such defects we are lost, though spared the fire and suffering of hell in one affliction only, that without hope we live on in desire. I thought how many worthy souls there were suspended in that limbo, and a weight closed in on my heart for what the noblest suffer. Instruct me, master and most noble sir, I prayed to him better to understand the perfect creed that conquers every error. Has any, by his own or another's merit, ever gone from this place to blessedness? He sensed my inner question and answered it. I was still new to this estate of tears when a mighty one descended here among us, crowned with his sign of his victorious years. He took from us the shade of our first parent, of Abel, his pure son, of ancient Noah, of Moses, the bringer of law, the obedient father Abraham, David the king, Israel with his father and children, Rachel the holy vessel for his blessing, and many more. He chose for elevation among the elect. And before these, you must know, no human soul had ever won salvation. We had not paused as he spoke, but held our road and passed, meanwhile, beyond oppressive souls crowded about like trees in a thick wood. And we had not traveled far from where I woke when I made out a radiance before us that struck away a hemisphere of dark. We were still some distance back in the long night, yet near enough that I saw, half-sensed, what quality of souls lived in that light. O oh, ornament and wisdom of art! What souls are these whose merit lights their way even in hell? What joy sets them apart? And he to me, The signature of honor they left on earth is recognized in heaven and wins them ease in hell out of God's favor. And as he spoke, a voice rang on the air. Honor the prince of poets. The soul and the glory that went from us returns. He is here. He is here. The cry ceased, and the echo passed from hearing. I saw four mighty presences come towards us with neither joy nor sorrow in their bearing. Note well, my master said as they came on, the soul that leads the rest with sword in hand as if he were their captain and champion. It is Homer, singing master of the earth. Next to him, Horus, the satirist. Ovid is third and Lucian is the fourth. Since all of these have part in the high name the voice proclaimed, calling me Prince of Poets, the honor they do me honors them. So I saw gathered at the edge of light the masters of that highest school whose song outsoars all others like an eagle's flight. After they had talked together a while, they turned and welcomed me most graciously at which I saw my approving master smile. And they honored me far beyond courtesy, for they included me in their own number, making me sixth in that high company. So we moved towards the light, and as we passed we spoke of things as well omitted here, as it was sweet to touch on there. At last we reached the base of a great citadel, circled by seven towering battlements, and by a sweet brook flowing around them all, this we passed over as if it was firm ground. Through seven gates I entered with those sages, 
and came to a green meadow blooming round. There, with solemn and majestic poise, stood many people gathered in the light, speaking infrequently with muted voice. Past that enameled green, we six withdrew into a luminous and open height from which each soul among them stood in view. And there, directly before me on the green, the master souls of time were shown to me. I glory in the glory I have seen. Electra stood in great company, among whom I saw Hector and Aeneas, and Caesar in armor with his falcon's eye. I saw Camilla and the Queen Amazon across the field. I saw the Latian king seated there with his daughter by his throne, and the good Brutus who overthrew the Tarkin, Lucreta, Julia, Marcia, and Cornelia, and by himself apart, the Saladin. And raising my eyes a little, I saw on high Aristotle, the master of those who know, ringed by the great souls of philosophy. All wait upon him for their honor and his. I saw Socrates and Plato at his side before all others there, Democritus, who ascribes the world to chance, Diogenes, and with him there Thales, Zeno, Heraclitus, and Empedocles. And I saw the wise collector and analyst, Discorides, I mean. I saw Orpheus there, Tully, Linus, Seneca the moralist, Eusalid the geometer, and Ptolemy, Hippocrates, Galen, Aviancena, and Averroes of the Great Commentary. I cannot count so much nobility. My longer theme pursues me so that often the word falls short of the reality. My company of six is reduced by four. My master leads me by another road out of that serenity to the roar and the trembling air of hell. I pass from light into the kingdom of eternal night. That was Canto 3 and 4 of The Inferno by Dante Alighieri. And I think it's pretty clear what we're going to see and how we're going to see it. And again, I'm no Dante scholar, so I can only take away what I'm capable to take away. And the first big thing we saw after being yelled at by that, that old man with the boat I didn't think it was such a big deal, but he did. So the first big thing we saw was the large sail, big flag being flown in circles, and people chasing it. And these people have to chase the flag because they're being chased by hornets and bees. And that's what they said later on, that your greatest fear can be turned into your only want. So their only want is to catch that flag. And they keep getting stung by wasps and bees. And the bees only sting them more the more they run. So they have all these bee bites and boils and blisters. And those all break and rip open and mix with the tears that they cry. And that washes down their bodies and hits the, the disgusting dirt where it's fed on by maggots and worms. And that was the first floor. That's the first floor. And we'll deal with that next time. Because this has been Dr. Peace Theater. And my name is Dr. Dennis Business. And as always, my friend.